Good morning, church. It's good to start the, another Sunday with baptism. And so we encourage you to make your way in and get to your seats as we uh, prepare to do that. I want to remind you that here at First Baptist, we do not believe that baptism saves you, but instead it is a declaration that you are trusting in the Lord Jesus. And so we're excited today to have three who are coming forward to make that declaration. And so, as we do uh, with nearly every baptism, I invite you to turn your attention to the screens and check out this, work, this testimony video. I was Glenn. mean, I was rude to my siblings. Um, I've been nice to my siblings. Uh, I haven't been really mean to my, uh, been mean to my friends anymore. To know Jesus into my heart as my savior. I would like to thank Pastor Murphy. I would like to thank my parents, right, my sisters, and my, uh, I'd like to thank Pastor Rob. All right, buddy, come right over here. Step up on there. Well, I'll hold you. Got it? Okay, buddy, come over here. All right, we first have Michael Wallace coming for baptism today. Uh, here at First Baptist, we uh, always give the opportunity for believing fathers to baptize uh, their children who make a profession of faith as a reminder that you're the first pastor that they have. And so we uh, love to do that. And so Bodie's going to be baptizing Michael today. Michael, are you trusting in the Lord Jesus alone for your salvation? Yes. Amen. And based on your profession of faith, your dad's going to baptize you as our brother in Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Grab your nose. There you go. Okay. Buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Amen. God bless you. All right, I invite you to turn your attention back to the screen to see Ryan's testimony. I'd say I had more of an attitude. I would like try to get my way because, um, because I can't get to heaven without Jesus. Um, I'm a sinner, so I need to, like, trust in Jesus so I can get to heaven and be, like, be a better person spiritually. Um, my attitude has been improving. I have not been trying to, like, get my way all the time. Pastor Benji, Pastor Rob, and my mom. All right, brother, let's just step right here. And Ryan, are you trusting in the Lord Jesus alone for your salvation? Yes. And based on your profession of faith, I baptize you as my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There you go. Buried with Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. Amen. Congratulations, brother. Once again, turn your attention to the screens. Check out Kristen's testimony. There you go. I was um, completely defiant, living in, um, I, I was completely rebellious. Um, very, very selfish, and, um, and I knew it. I was very aware of the fact that I should not be living that way. Well, I was saved when I was um, in, in sixth grade after um, we had like a, a, I went to a um, sleepaway camp. It was a Christian camp. And when I came back from the camp, I was all excited and everything. And I asked my mom to buy me my first Bible. And um, I came home and 
and I started reading it regularly, but I, I kind of quickly became discouraged because or I realized that um, I was never going to live up to everything that I thought I was supposed to be doing correctly, you know. Um, and, um, yeah, from there, I, I kind of just turned away and um, just acted out as a teenager and as a young adult. And um, when I finally started reading the Bible again as an adult, um, I finally understood the scriptures as a whole. I finally understood how, uh, Jesus' fulfillment of the Old Testament. And it just, it, it literally, it brought it all together for me. I never understood, and until that happened, I never understood like the value of the cross in, in my own life, like the weight that that held. And once I did, once that kind of clicked, then, um, you know, you, you need to respond to that. So you have to, I needed to respond to that. And so that kind of changed everything for me. Well, that certainly prepared me. Uh, it brought me through some very, very difficult times with, absolute peace that would not have been possible otherwise. Um, it's changed the way that I raise my kids, the way that I look at every, the way, absolutely the way that I look at everything. I want to be baptized as a, just to declare, like to be able to share my testimony and to just um, to share what Jesus has done for me and in my life. I'd actually like to thank my kids <laughs> for getting me here. <laughs> All right, Christian. So you made a profession of faith a little while ago, but now you're making that public through baptism, right? Yep. And you're trusting in the Lord Jesus alone for your salvation. Yes, well, then based on that profession of faith, I baptize you as my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. Thank you. Okay. Amen, church. Well, as I remind you, every time we have the pleasure of doing baptism, we have water. And so if you have not yet followed the Lord in Believer's baptism, we encourage you to do so. And we would be happy to make that happen uh, for you as soon as possible. Right. Good morning, church. Welcome to First Baptist. Those that are here present as well as those that are uh, viewing us over live stream. Um, isn't it great to start out with baptisms? Isn't it great? And to hear testimonies. We got to hear a testimony at the, the youth night of worship, and we got to hear three more this morning. It's so exciting, so encouraging. So thank you for being here. We've got our, uh, as you came into the worship center, should have received a uh, bulletin. On the bulletin, it gives you the order of worship, some of the key announcements for the week, but also a tear-off strip. And so we encourage you to fill that out, uh, particularly if you're a new person here. But for all people, there's an opportunity to give praise to God, an opportunity to offer a prayer request. Uh, as you leave the sanctuary, there's an offering plate at all the exits. Just deposit that in the offering plate, and we will uh, be praying over that for the week. Let's prepare our hearts for worship by the reading of God's word. Our text this morning is 1 Chronicles 29, verses 11 through 13. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the splendor and the majesty. For everything in the heavens and on earth belongs to you. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all. Riches and honor come from you, and you are the ruler of everything. Power and might are in your hand, and it is in your hand to make great and to give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Church, let's stand together and worship as we sing, How Great Thou Art. Church, let's lift our voices together. Oh Lord, my God, when I
greatness, we give all praise to him alone. Let's sing those words together. All praise to him, the God of life, who formed the mountains by his mind. All praise to him, who names the stars that sing his fame in skies afar. All praise to him, who reigns in love, who guides the galaxies above, yet bears. Great singing. You may be seated as we continue to worship. This is what the Lord says. The wise person should not boast in his wisdom. The strong should not boast in his strength. The wealth should not boast in his wealth. But the one who boasts should boast in this, that he understands and knows that I am the Lord. Showing faithful love justice and righteousness on the earth for i delight in these things this is the lord's declaration amen well, we gather this morning to declare that our worth is not in what we own and who we are and the successes we may have in this life but our worth is found in our savior jesus christ as hannah just read in knowing him in boasting in him in delighting in him alone so church, let's sing that together. You may remain seated, which would you declare those truths with us as we sing? And 
trust in him no other my soul is this morning as we turn to your word and prayer together that we would trust in you and no other that we would trust in you and your word alone so come speak to us now through the Bible your word we pray in Christ's name amen amen we come to a time in this service it's called the pastoral prayer I'm going to spend some time praying with you and for you, and uh, as we do, typically do two things. One, give you the opportunity to share the name of someone that you're praying for or that is on your heart that you would like to have lifted up in prayer. Could be somebody that you're praying would come to faith in Christ. Maybe you're one, as we've uh, been uh, going for about eight or nine months now in the who's your one emphasis. Um, could be somebody who's just suffered a loss. Could be somebody who's dealing with health issues. But if you've come into the room today and you've got somebody that's been on your heart and your mind that you want to lift up in prayer, all around this room, I just want you to say their name out loud. So all around the room, somebody that you're praying for, say their name out loud. Go ahead. Amen. We're going to pray for those folks here in just a second and take them before the Lord, and he knows each situation. That's usually, I talk to you about a part of the world where it's difficult to be a Christian and share with you some information from the Operation World app. I'm not going to do that today. Uh, because of the events that unfolded yesterday in Buffalo, New York. And unless you've been uh, out of the loop with the news, you know that yesterday an 18-year-old uh, self-professed white supremacist went into a supermarket in Buffalo, New York, and according to his own writings, his own social media posts, his own manifesto, his intention was to kill as many black people as he could. Such... A disposition comes straight from the pit of hell. 
Not only did he intend to go do such a thing, but he live streamed it through a helmet cam as he shot people in the parking lot and then in the store, eventually killing 10 and seriously injuring three. Now, there are those who like to pretend that we have no racial issues at all in our nation. Let me suggest that we are a far cry from that. It's clear we do. And I want to spend some time today praying for the families of those that he killed, for the recovery of those that he wounded, and quite frankly, for a spiritual awakening in our nation. Because at the end of the day, this next week, we're going to hear from politicians and influencers and all kinds of other people about all the things that we need to do to make this kind of thing fixed or right. Hate that is motivated by race or animus against an individual because of their background or whatever it may be, that kind of hate can only be transformed by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And it will require not more gun laws and not more hate laws and not more of those kinds of things, but it's going to require a spiritual awakening in our nation. Now, you might think that there needs to be other things added to that, and that's fine. You're welcome to your opinion. But I'm a person who only has the Bible to offer you. And what I read in the Scripture is that it is the enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And it is the Lord Jesus Christ who comes to give life and life abundantly. And so I'm praying for a spiritual awakening in our nation. And quite honestly, I'm praying for those of us who are followers of Jesus to demonstrate a bit of compassion to those who suffer at the hands of folks who are filled with such hate and rage. So I want you to enjoy me in a word of prayer. Father, we are thankful to be able to come to you because your word says that we can bring our concerns to you. We can we can bring our burdens to you, and we can, we can lay those at your feet because you care for us. And today, Lord, we're burdened. Some of us in this room are burdened by friends and family and coworkers and individuals we know that, have, that, have, that are far from you or that are struggling with health issues or that have experienced a difficulty in life in some way, and they're heavy on our hearts today. And so we mention their name out loud, and I pray in each situation that you would do your work of drawing them to yourself. And Father, our hearts are heavy today as we suffer with those in the Buffalo, New York area. I think particularly of the families of the 10 who lost their loved ones, folks that were simply going to work or going to the grocery store and had no anticipation, no expectation that they would step into eternity. Father, I pray that you would do what only you can do, and that is to take a curse, an evil, wicked act, and somehow bring glory to your own name through it. Lord, I don't pretend to know how you can do that. My heart just aches for those who were who were targeted and attacked because they didn't look like the guy carrying the gun. So God, I have to leave it in your hands to figure out how to, how to use this horrible tragedy and somehow bring good from it. And God, I believe that we'll only see an end to these kinds of events as men and women, boys and girls around our nation come to faith in Christ in Jesus. Only Jesus can transform a heart that would be so filled with rage as to take such an act. So God, we as your people call on you to bring a spiritual awakening in our nation. 
Lord, draw people in this country to yourself. We have had our fill of politicians promising answers and laws on the books promising to fix things. When the heart, your word says, it is the heart that is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And only you can change the heart. And God, we call on you to do that. We call on you to be gracious and compassionate again to those families who lost loved ones, to those who are recovering. Lord, we pray that you would speed their recovery and strengthen them, that your spirit would be very close to them. God, we offer this to you because it's the only thing we know to do. And we trust you to do what is for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me ask you to turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. We are nearing the end of our series from the book of Philippians entitled Live with Joy. In fact, we have just two left this week and next. And this week I want to talk to you about the secret of contentment. I recall a, a story that was told by Myron Cohen. Myron Cohen was a a comedian in the 1950s and 60s, and uh, while I wasn't alive then, contrary to popular belief uh, among some of our younger crowd, uh, I wasn't alive then. Uh, I'm a big fan of comedians from the 50s and 60s. They had a, a different way of looking at things, and Myron Cohen used to tell the story of a somewhat disgruntled and curmudgeonly grandmother who was watching her grandchild playing on the beach. And as she's watching her grandchild playing on the beach, a, a giant wave came in and, and scooped up that grandson, and, 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 and took him out to sea to the grandmother's horror. And as she sees this taking place, she immediately begins to cry out to God, Oh, dear God, you must save my grandson. It's the only thing I want. Please, Lord, bring him back. Do not let him be lost like this. All I ask is that you would bring him back. Another wave comes, delivers the grandson right on the beach, right next to her. She looks him up and down. Looks back to heaven and says, he had a hat when you took him out. <laughs> right? She had a problem with contentment, right? She had a little problem with being satisfied with what God had done. Maybe you know someone like that. Maybe you are someone like that. Nothing's ever good enough. Nothing ever seems to satisfy. And if that's how you are, if you know somebody like that, you should know that, that you're not alone. Indeed, the fact of the matter is, most of our relatives, friends, and neighbors, and co-workers, and fellow students are in that same boat. In fact, let me, let me share this with you. A recent study found that just 14% of American adults describe themselves as very happy. What's incredible is that that is down from 31% just two years prior in, in, in that year, two years prior, only 23% said they often or sometimes feel isolated. But in the most recent study, 50% say they feel isolated often or sometimes. The survey draws on nearly a half century of research from the General Social Survey, which has collected data on American attitudes going all the way back to 1972. They would do a study about every two years and prior to the most recent study, no less than 29% of Americans had ever called themselves anything other than very happy. In other words, that was the low mark, 29%. Our satisfaction, our, our discontentment seems to be growing. So how is it that we as followers of Christ, how is it that we as Christians, as followers of Jesus, how is it that we are to respond well, if you're in Philippians chapter 4, I want to read to you verses 10 to 14. As we find there, Paul sharing what I call the secret of contentment. So if you have your Bibles available or your electronic devices booted up, I invite you to stand, please, as we honor the God of the Word by standing for the reading of His Word. Scripture reads this way, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly because once again you renewed your care for me. You were, in fact, concerned about me, but lacked the opportunity to show it. I do not say this out of need, 
For I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know both how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Still, you did well by partnering with me in my hardship. May God bless the reading of his word. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the way that it speaks to us. And I pray that today it would, in fact, speak to us. I pray that your spirit would apply your word to your people's hearts and that we would leave here changed from when we came in. May we have our eyes open and our hearts sensitized to what your spirit would say to us today. And I pray that you would guard the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart on this text. May what I proclaim about you be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As we come to this section of Paul's letter, as I mentioned, we're nearing the conclusion. We're nearing the conclusion not just of our sermon series, but of the letter, in fact, that he has written. And just prior, the prior nine verses in particular, he has given a good amount of practical guidance much of that practical guidance about how to follow him or how to, how to model after him. Now he turns his attention to thanking the Philippians for their gift. After all, that was the occasion of the letter. You'll remember that, that Epaphroditus had shown up with this gift from the church at Philippi to Paul as he was there in need in prison. And he now wants to turn his attention to thanking them. But I want you to note that he doesn't focus on the gift itself. He focuses on what the gift represents. Notice his emphasis is that they've renewed their care in verse 10. They've renewed their care for him. He notes that they didn't have an opportunity to do so before, but now they have. And his emphasis, though, again, is not on the monetary gift, but something more significant than that, and that is their friendship. That's what really got him excited. They had not forgotten him. They had not abandoned him. That survey I mentioned said that nearly 50% of people have said, in the most recent survey, that they they feel sometimes they feel alone or isolated. Certainly Paul must have felt that way in prison, miles and miles away from, from people that he knew and that he cared about. Alone. And now he's reminded that there are people who care about him. They've not forgotten him. They've not cast him aside. They've not decided since he's in prison, since he's been taken captive, we want nothing else to do with him. No, 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 they've not done that at all. They've renewed their care for him. That is, their friendship is still thriving. They do love him. And they've been able to show him that he is still first and foremost in their thoughts. Now, what he does in this section is very interesting, and we're gonna cover it over the next two weeks. In fact, next week we're going to delve deeply into the fact uh, of what he says about the gift itself and why he talks about the gift and how he talks about it. But this week, I want to look at something else, and that is Paul's encouragement to the Philippians to follow his lead when it comes to the issue of contentment and particularly where they find their contentment. He wants them to understand where true contentment comes from. And for us as followers of Jesus, living in a world that is so often set against the things of God, we have to come to understand where true contentment is found. The temptation is too great to try to find our contentment in the same places that the culture says we should find it. So where does Paul say contentment comes from? Well, let me first of all tell you what he tells them contentment's not. He tells them that the, the source of contentment is not about circumstances. Contentment is not about circumstances. I think I could spend the rest of the sermon saying that contentment is not about circumstances and some of us might start to believe it. Right? Because it's easy sitting in a church service like this to hear the pastor say contentment's not about circumstances and we go, Amen. And then we go out to the restaurant this afternoon and it takes a little longer than usual to get our food from the kitchen. And we lose our contentment. 
I can't believe what's taken them so long. I don't know. We've been sitting here for half an hour. I don't know what their problem is. And I pray that if that happens to you today, you'll hear a little voice that says, contentment is not about circumstances. And then you can have roast preacher for lunch <laughs> as you complain about him, what he was talking about. He just doesn't know how hungry I am. And let me tell you, I'm going to try to avoid that because I'm just going to plan to go to a buffet. So hopefully it won't have been put there yesterday. We don't know. But he says contentment's not about circumstances. Look, look at the text. In two separate places, in fact, in two verses back to back, he makes this point. In verse 11, he says he's learned to be content whatever the circumstances. And in verse 12, in any and all circumstances. Can you say any and all? Yeah, yeah. When the lunch takes a while to get to your table from the kitchen today, that's included in any and all. Here's what's interesting. This is the only place that the adjective for the word content is used in the entire New Testament. Now, Paul uses the noun in a couple of other places, but it's not a word frequently found in the New Testament. And there's a reason for that, because it was a word that was commonly used by the Stoics to describe their philosophy of life. Now, if you're not up on what all the ancient Greek philosophies were, let me help you with this. When you think of the Stoics, you should think of Mr. Spock from Star Trek. Whether that means you think of the, the new uh, young Mr. Spock or whether you think of Leonard Nimoy as Mr. Spock, it's irrelevant. You think of Mr. Spock. The Vulcans, they suppressed emotions. They, were, they wanted to be above emotions. They wanted to ignore the circumstances around them and be emotion-free. The Stoics were the Greek philosophy that Vulcan ideology in Star Trek. I am a Star Trek nerd, by the way, in case you didn't get it. There's only two kind of people in the world, Star Trek and Star Wars, otherwise known as saved and lost. <laughs> so us Star Trek people, we, we, you know, anyway, sorry, I digress. The Stoics, they wanted to act as if they were oblivious to their circumstances to try to be above them. Paul uses their word, but that's not what he means. He does not mean we're going to try to be oblivious to the circumstances. What Paul wants to do is take their word and fill it with a new meaning by saying a content person is one who is not defined by their circumstances. They look those circumstances square in the face. They recognize what they are. They recognize that they're evil or they're wicked or they're difficult or they're tragic. The content person is able to look squarely at those circumstances and refuse to be defined by them. Paul says contentment is not about circumstances. He's glad that their friendship's been renewed, but understand, it's not because their gift somehow changed his outlook. That would betray the gospel message. If a change in our circumstances fundamentally changes our outlook, we're looking for contentment in the wrong place. I'll say that again. Let me say that again. If a change in our circumstances fundamentally changes our outlook, we're looking for contentment in the wrong place. Think about the study that I cited in the introduction. Why would a lengthy study suddenly see a record number of Americans indicate, a, a record low number of Americans indicate that they were very happy? Why would the number drop from 31%, that's almost one out of three, to just 14%. Well, what I didn't tell you was when the study was conducted. I said it was recent. But now if I tell you that the study was conducted in May of 2020, does that help explain the drop? Yeah. COVID pandemic was just a few months old. It was, and it, and it seemed to accelerate the pace of our dissatisfaction. In May of 2020, we didn't know much about COVID. We didn't, we didn't know much about it at all. What we did know is we we're facing dire predictions. We were dealing with lockdowns, mandatory masking, schools and churches being closed. Nearly every major sporting outfit, the NCAA, Major League Baseball, the NHL, NBA, everybody was shut down. Concerts were shut down. Theater was shut down. Life was significantly disrupted. And here's, what I, here's the connection I want to make. Because many of us tie our contentment, and happiness is a measure of contentment, many of us tie our contentment to external circumstances. 
And when those external circumstances changed, a lot of people didn't know how to process it. We tie our, our contentment to external circumstances. In other words, if this happens, I'm happy or I'm content. If that happens, I'm not happy or content. As a result, we tend to constantly be bouncing around emotionally. Happy today, unhappy tomorrow. Happy right now, unhappy later this afternoon. Happy in the parking lot, leaving unhappy when I try to get out on Park Street. Right? Some of you may have to say to the person driving today when you're leaving, Contentment is not based on circumstances. We'll get there, don't worry. What happens though is when, when we get thrown a curve, when, when life gets disrupted, and I don't know if you're aware of this, but life will get disrupted. But if we tie our happiness or contentment to circumstances, every time life gets disrupted, we are thrown for a loop. Now, don't hear me saying that emotions are somehow bad. That's not what Paul's saying. He borrows the phrase from the Stoics, but he doesn't, he doesn't believe what they do, that emotions are bad in and of themselves. What, he wants, to, what the, he wants the Philippians to understand is, while our outward appearance, our outward demeanor may appear to be like the Stoics, our reason, our source of life is radically different. The Stoics simply want to press down and ignore their circumstances. The Christian finds that circumstances come from somewhere else, not from circumstances. And we'll see where in just a minute. So the first thing he tells him is it can't be about circumstances. The second thing he tells him is contentment cannot be about personality. The source of contentment is not about personality. I mentioned that Paul used the word circumstance in two verses. He also uses another word, learned. In verse 11, he says, I learned to be content. In verse 12, I learned the secret of being content. Learned. And so much of our culture, and, and even in the church world, it's somewhat fashionable to blame all sorts of things on our personality. We say it all kinds of ways. Well, I'm not wired that way. I'm just not, I'm just not, I'm just not wired, wired that way. Or that's just not how I am. That's just not me. That's just not me. I have a different kind of personality. We give a host of other passive excuses for our behavior. And when it comes to the issue of contentment, we do the exact same thing. In fact, some of you, perhaps even now, in your minds, are saying, well, pastor, that's fine for you. I mean, you're a pastor. You read the Bible all the time. Angels sing when you wake up in the morning. We understand. You walk on clouds. We get it. That's not true, by the way. Angels don't sing when I wake up. Far from it. And I certainly don't walk on clouds. And I'm here to tell you that it's not about personality. But that's what we want to say. Pastor, I'm just not like that. I, I'm just a person who worries. That's just who I am. Yeah, Jesus wants to change that. Are you with me? That's what he wants to change. If, if you were good enough without Jesus, you wouldn't have needed him. He wants to change you and transform you into the image of Christ. And if you as a follower of Jesus go, that's just not my personality. I'm just a worrier. That's just what I do. I want to say, where do we read in the Bible that Jesus ever worried? Anywhere? No. I've read it once or twice. A few more times than that. And I don't ever come across a text that says, and Jesus was so befuddled, he had no idea what to do. He spent hours worrying over his next step. Do we find that in the scripture? You may respond, no. No. And who is it that God intends to transform us into the image of? Jesus. It is Christ that is to live his life through us. So when you say as a follower of Jesus, well, that's just my personality. I just worry. I want to say that's a part of your personality God wants to transform. Just like I would say to the person who goes, well, it's just part of my personality to get angry. I say, yeah, that's a part of your personality Jesus wants to transform. It's not about personality. For all of us, we need, to be we need to be reminded of what Paul says here. 
I have learned. That means Paul did not begin there. You understand? He didn't start there. I have learned to be content. I have learned the secret of contentment. It tells me that contentment is not something that we're born with. It's something that I learn through viewing all of the experiences of life through the lens of the Holy Spirit. That God takes the events of my life, lived under the power of the Holy Spirit, and he filters them through the lens of his greater purposes. He has something else he's trying to accomplish. We see the problems, we just see the inconvenience, we just see the frustration, we just see the surface, but God has something else in mind. Namely, to mold us and shape us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we begin to see all of the experiences of our life through the lens of his greater purpose, we suddenly see our circumstances as an opportunity or as a means to an end. I'll tell you what I mean. We see poverty, for example, as an opportunity to depend on God. We see wealth as an opportunity to show care for the poor. We see sickness as an opportunity to value Christ above our health. We see disappointment as an opportunity to trust God for something better. You say, Pastor, I don't, I don't know if I can, I can get there. Look, look, you're not going to get there in a heartbeat. What's Paul say? I have learned so it takes discipline to constantly see these circumstances in light of what God is trying to do in our heart and life who he's trying to change us into what he's trying to mold us into what he's trying to shape us into so our contentment can't be about circumstances and it can't be about personality he deals with those two things so what is it about well that brings me to my third observation, and that is that contentment is found in Christ alone. Now we see that in verse 13. One of the most famous verses in this entire letter. I'm able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Who is it that strengthens Paul? It is, of course, Christ and Christ alone. And what is it that Paul says he is able to do through the strength of Christ? All things. Well, what does he mean by all things? Well, based on the way I see this used so often in social media, he means we get the promotion, our team wins the ball game, we learn a new skill, we learn a new hobby, we learn a new language. It's when we're winning that we'd love to bring this verse out. That's how we often use this verse. That Christ empowers us to accomplish great things. But is that the context in which Paul pens this verse? No, it's not. It's set in the context of Paul living through times of plenty and times of great need. What we might call, for our sake, winning and losing. I want you to imagine for just a minute. Your favorite sports team makes it to the championship game of whatever sport it happens to be. And they lose. And they lose bad. And the star player on your favorite team goes to Instagram and posts a picture of himself or herself smiling with the final score in the background that shows that they've lost and at the bottom puts... I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. My guess is that the majority of people would think that that player had lost their mind. That's not what we typically do. We typically, when we're getting the MVP trophy and we're celebrating the victory and we're being interviewed by the reporter about how great the victory was and how wonderful we just played the game, that's when we throw it in there. I want to give thanks to the Lord above. I can do all things through him who strengthens me, and we go on and on. We don't say it much when we're losing. And yet that's exactly what Paul is doing here because the immediate context in which he is writing this verse, he is writing it from a prison cell, right? He's not writing it from a villa overlooking the French Riviera. 
He's writing it from a prison cell in which he is dependent upon other people to bring him food and drink and resources or he'll starve to death. He is writing it from a position of weakness. Not only is he in prison, but he is being maligned outside of the prison by other people who are free. He's being mocked and he's being ridiculed. And the whole time this is happening, he is hungry and in need. And it's in that context of being in prison, being maligned, being mocked, being ridiculed, being hungry, that he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. He is simply fleshing out here what he meant when he said to live is Christ. Whatever Christ brings my way, that is what I am able to do. Why? Because it's Christ who strengthens me. That's the secret of contentment. Christ alone. The reality is that our source of greatest dissatisfaction, unhappiness, and discontentment comes from the fact that we are not whole or complete apart from a relationship with Christ. And so many of us spend our entire lives trying to find that missing piece to find, to fix what's wrong with us. And yet no searching for inner peace is ever going to suffice. No searching uh, for, for money or possessions or success or accomplishments or promotions or the perfect grade or the perfect score or getting into our, our preferred college. None of that's ever going to be enough. We're going to be like the grandma on the beach who says he had a hat. Always going to need something else. Years ago, a movie was made about the Jamaican bobsled team. I trust most of you my age have seen it. Some of you younger have, called Cool Runnings, right? John Candy was in it. He played a coach that had been discredited because he was cheating. He was caught cheating. So he was a discredited coach. And when, when the, the Jamaicans were trying to get a bobsled team together, uh, as the movie goes, they call on this discredited coach. No, nobody else would let him coach. They call on him to help him out, help him out, get a team together. And the night before their big run, the night before they were, they were scheduled to have their, their big event, uh, the, the character played by John Candy is talking to one of his main uh, members of the bobsled team. And that guy asks him why he cheated. And Candy, John Candy says, because I had to win. And the other guy says, but coach, you had two gold medals. You had it all. And John Candy's character replies, a gold medal is a wonderful thing. But if you're not enough without it, you'll never be enough with it. What Paul is trying to explain to the Philippians is this. If you are not content with Christ alone, you will never be content with anything other than Christ alone. We must be content with Christ alone. My suspicion is some of you may have come here today looking for some peace and contentment, something to make sense out of life. You came to church looking for something to make your life better. Well, let me tell you, we have absolutely nothing to offer you that can make your life better except introducing you to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all we got. Only a personal relationship with Jesus will make sense out of life. But hear me, it will not make it perfect. It will not make it pain-free. But a relationship with Jesus will allow you to experience contentment, whether you're in the midst of pain or pleasure, whether you're in the midst of having a little or having a lot, whether you are well-fed or whether you're hungry, whether you feel like you're on top or whether you feel like you're oppressed, whether you feel like everything's going your way or you feel like everything is against you, only Christ can give you contentment in any and all circumstances. Religion cannot do that. Only Jesus can. So if you're here this morning and you're watching by way of live stream, I would just encourage you to ask yourself, has there come a time in your life where you've come to the end of yourself, where you've, you've come to realize that you've sinned against a holy God and you need his forgiveness and you need Jesus Christ in your life? Have you come to that place in your life? Because until you get there, nothing else will ever satisfy. 
Until you're willing to give up trying to please God on your own and invite Christ to come into your life and to forgive your sins, you're going to continue to try to fill your life with all sorts of other things. And the truth is, until you find contentment in Christ alone, you will never find it in anything else. So I would encourage you today, if you've not made that commitment yet, I would encourage you today to call on the Lord Jesus to forgive your sins and to come into your life. And then let somebody know about it. Tell somebody. And maybe you're here today and you are a follower of Jesus and and you've gotten caught up in just my personality and I'm worried and I'm all this stuff. I would encourage you just to go to the Lord in prayer and confess that sin. And say, God, please mold me and shape me more and more into the image of Christ. Where I find my greatest contentment in who Jesus is and who you say I am in him. Would you join me, please, in a word of prayer. Father, I come to you this morning and I ask you to use this time in your word. What your word describes as the foolishness of preaching. Use it for your glory. If there are those who are not sure they're in a relationship with you, would you draw them to yourself? And if there are those who are here that are your followers, but they've just gotten caught up in in being filled with worry and fear and anger and frustration, Lord, would you drive them to contentment in Christ? Father, there's much in our world that we're not pleased with there's much in our world that we would love for you to change but Lord help us to never tie our contentment to those things but rather to Christ and Christ alone in Jesus name amen I'm going to ask you to stand please as we sing a song of response I'll be right here at the front I'd be happy to pray with you about anything that you may be wrestling with or struggling with And certainly would be delighted to introduce you to Jesus this morning if you don't know him.
Amen. 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 You may be Amen. seated. We were doing that in unison, weren't we? <laughs> Maybe seated. It's been good to be in the Lord's house today. Amen, church? Amen. We're excited about the fact that, again, we're coming to the end of our, our Philippians series. Not excited about being at the end of it, but just always like to finish something. So uh, we'll do that next week. And then um, uh, if you've been around here for more than one summer, you know that starting Memorial Day weekend, the summer of Psalms resumes as we work our way through all 150 Psalms uh, over the next, oh, I think we got about nine years left, something like that. And so um, you come prepared uh, for that. On the back of your bulletin, very quickly, I just want to draw your attention to a couple of things and then we'll be dismissed. Uh, Vacation Bible School registration is open for volunteers as well as for children. So we encourage you to take advantage of that. Uh, we have a ministry conference coming up. That's kind of an f- official business meeting. We only do those twice a year, once in May, once in December. The December is the big one. In May, we really, uh, our biggest focus in May is to uh, nominate messengers to the Southern Baptist Convention in Anaheim. Uh, Anaheim, California, that is. And so we've got several uh, guys who are willing to go. And uh, so we're going to do that on May the 25th. And then that shouldn't take long. And we'll follow that up with a a Bible study after that. Uh, I remind you as well, some of you have registered. In fact, a good number of you have registered for the Getting Your Final Affairs in Order event. That's going to be Tuesday at 2.30 in the Fellowship Hall. And uh, if you've not signed up for that yet, we encourage you to do so. And uh, it'll be a great event. Uh, Dick Gallagher is going to lead that, and he does a great job with that. And then finally, let me remind you that we have offering plates at the doors, and you're welcome to drop a gift in there if you're like me, kind of old school, and you bring an envelope with you, or you're welcome to give online and support the work that the Lord is doing here. And I am thankful for your faithfulness to continue to give. In fact, next week as we wrap up Philippians, we're going to talk about what it means to uh, engage in joy-filled investing. And uh, we'll talk about that uh, And if you think it's tied to the stock market, you would be wrong. That would be tying it to circumstances. That's something completely different. So, Chris Smith, looks like you are our deacon of the day, my brother. So why don't you come on up here and uh, feel free to send us out the right way. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning, church. I first want to draw your attention to the flowers. They're in loving memory of manure Eways on his May 20th birthday, given by Ann and daughters Kathy, Karen, Kay, Chrissy, and grandchildren. I also want to remind you, I will be down here for a few minutes uh, after the service. If you have something you want to talk about or pray about, I'll be down here. So let us uh, pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today. Lord, just want to thank you for this time we've had to be together in fellowship and worship want to thank you for uh, your message that uh, Pastor Rob has brought to us. And as we leave, Lord, I ask that uh, as we go throughout this week, that uh, uh, we all we do and say would bring honor and glory to you throughout this week and with all we meet. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.